what's going on YouTube? It's your buddy Will from the What's Up in the Sky 37 channel. We're online at www.whatsupinthesky.com where we've got all sorts of good people posting articles, uh, images, videos. It's really starting to grow the website. Check it out. So Tuesday was my birthday, the 14th. This turned 34. Keep it rock and roll. This is my new year. And uh, it's going to start out with some interesting stuff. We haven't done space news in a while, so I wanted to come do some space news. We've had a lot of good videos lately. A um, couple that hit pretty big. Uh, I've had more numbers and views on my last probably 10 videos than I've had in a while. So thank you guys for sharing it. Because it, honestly, I couldn't do this without you guys. I, you're the ones that share the videos. They get, end up getting on Facebook and going with our, within our community. But I've noticed we've really started to bring some new people in. People that haven't even looked at this stuff before are starting to come in. And that's what I'm here trying to do. And, and we're trying to build this database here of place. You know, I want... Basically, I, I've said this a million times. I want to have my website and my channel be almost every single anomaly out there. I want to at least have it on a video, have it archived so with a link to it so people can get to it. And uh, we're going to start working on some of that stuff on the site. But we are really in for a treat here. This is time, this is the time to be living. I tell you what, especially with the with the technology we have, Comet Siding Spring is going to come very close to Mars. We're talking halfway between us and the moon, this comet is going to come flying by Mars. Um, they thought it was going to be a direct hit at first. Some people still do think it's going to be a direct hit. Um, it'll be interesting either way. Here is a list of all the spacecraft that are going to be watching this, uh, watching it. I mean, this is a lot of stuff. Plus, also, the rover should be able to see it. Now, it'll be interesting to see if the cloud behind it actually uh, ends up smashing like some of the dirt and dust and debris and what happens. Um, I know that Everybody, I know that India just got there with the MOM. Maven just got there. So we're really going to be, that's there to study just the atmosphere. So they're really going to see a lot of good stuff. Let me uh, go ahead and back up. This was from the NASA website. As always, the space news, I link all these links I bring up below. Um, so basically, uh, this is what I say. Comet C2013A1, also known as Comet Siding Spring, will pass within 87,000 miles of the red planet. I should say the reddish blue planet, less than half the distance between Earth and our moon and less than one tenth the distance of any known comet flyby of Earth. So, I mean, that's pretty, this is going to be very interesting. Um, his nucleus will come closest to Mars around 2.23 p.m. on uh, hurtling at about 126,000 miles per hour. The proximity will provide an unprecedented opportunity for researchers to gather both the comet and the effect on the Martian atmosphere. This is on October 19th. Um, we are just in the best position to have so many things watching it. You know, so many spacecraft, uh, rovers, um, sat, uh, telescopes here on Earth. You know, um, space.com is also covering it. Comets are icy leftovers. This is now. This is if you go along. Lately, I've been watching the Thunderbolt project. Uh, I recommend looking at their. If you if you've never watched the Thunderbolt project's videos, go watch their videos. Um, it really seems to make a lot more sense to me than some of this, what we're watching. But uh, especially as we're finding more and more, as we're actually like uh, Rosetta just came up and uh, is, is about to land on an asteroid. Things that we thought were different. Um, we're, we're finding out totally a difference uh, than what we thought before. And science is always changing. We're in one of those, if you think that we know everything about the world, the, the space, or even about Earth, I mean, you got to think wrong we can all say that, so. A comet will buzz by Mars this Sunday, October 19th, in an epic encounter that has astronomers around the world tingling with excitement. Uh, of course, it's just going, we've already said this. While the comet won't put on a show for sky watchers here on Earth, the fleet of robotic explorers at Mars will get an eyeful. They will be studying the comet, as well as observe the interactions between its shed particles and the thin Martian atmosphere. Comets are icy leftovers from the solar system's birth, and Siding Spring is a pristine object that has never been heat-treated by the sun before. So, any insights about the comet's composition and behavior could help researchers better understand how our cosmic neighbor began taking shape 4.6 billion years ago. This is a cosmic science gift that could potentially keep on giving, and the agency's diverse science missions will be in full received mode, says uh, former astronaut John Grunsfield, the NASA administrator for the mission director... Uh, he says the statement, actually, I, that's in the statement right here in the first link you can find. Like I said, hit the description for all of the links. 
All five operational spacecraft around the Red Planet, NASA's Mars Odyssey, Recon Mars Reconnaissance Order, and Maven Probe's India's Mom spacecraft, and Europe's Mars Express will start to fly by. Everybody's got to make sure they got their stuff <laughs> make it out of harm's way, and I know that a lot of them are doing that as of now. Um, Curiosity rover will crank up their crane up there next to watch the Martian surface as well. So it's, what I'm interested to see what what's going to happen when the supposed dust cloud behind it comes flying by. Um, they are saying there's no chance that the sighting spring will hit Mars during the flyby, and analysis suggests the material shed by the comet poses little danger to the spacecraft. Opportunity and curiosity will definitely be fine, protected by the Martian air. Um, because there is some, uh, if you watch my channel, we, there are, I th we think there's a little bit more atmosphere than we're being told. But NASA is taking precautions anyway. The space agency has maneuvered its orbiters to make sure they will be on the safe side from the planet when Mars gets closest to sighting spring's dust tail. So that, what's interesting to me is a dust tail. What's going to happen there? And it's a mountain-sized. Wow, this thing's huge. The mountain-sized sighting springs. That's that's a a mouthful right there. The mountain-sized Siding Springs spends most of its time in the Oort Cloud, a frigid comet repository that lies perhaps, perhaps, because this is all, um, I mean, th this is all speculation. We don't know this for sure. 50,000 50, astronomical units from the sun, about 93 million miles. Scientists think Siding Springs' multi-million year orbit has never taken it closer to the sun than the realm of the giant planets. So this comet, so the comet's current journey is something special, something to marvel at for several different reasons, researchers say. The comet got knocked into the inner solar system by the passage of a star near the Oort cloud. So they think, this, think about a comet that has started its travel probably at the dawn of man and is just now coming close. So basically, they're just basically saying this thing's been out there and it is on its way towards Mars. And we're going to see it come through. Hopefully it will not tear anything up up there. I'm sure it won't. Um, it would be pretty cool if it uh, smash Mars and we got to see what happened. I mean, it's already happened. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big object, though. Uh, it'd be interesting. Uh, I don't know if they'd be calling it. So they, they, If I knew that this was coming towards Earth at that little bit of a distance, I don't think I'd be so uh, cocky about my statement uh, saying it absolutely won't hit. So I thought this one was good from Live Science. This is going around the web right now. I saw this volcanoes on the moon may have erupted during the dinosaur age. If dinosaurs had invented telescopes, they might have seen the lava occasionally oozing from the surface of the moon. Scientists previously thought that the moon's volcanic activity died down a billion years ago. Well, that's what we were told. Um, the data from the NASA's lunar or LOR hits the lunar lava flow much more recently, perhaps less than 100 million years ago. This finding is the kind of science that literally is going to make geologists rewrite the textbook about the moon. John Keller, LOR project scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, said in a statement. All right. While in orbit around the moon, Apollo 15 astronauts took images of a strange volcanic deposit known as INA. INA. Um, researchers suggested that INA was quite young and may have formed in a localized burst of volcanic activity. Thought most of the moon's volcanoes occurred between 3.5 billion years ago and 1 billion years ago. So, but now photos from the spacecraft and orbiter that arrived at the moon in 2009, which have given us amazing anomalies, show that Ina has a lot of company. Scientists spotted 70 similar patches in the dark volcanic plains on the side of the moon that faces Earth. These distinctive rock deposits are called irregular moor patches. They're marked by the mixture of smooth, rounded mounds with blotches of rough, blocky terrain. Um, on the average, then they're less than a third of a mile across. As such, they're typically too small to be seen from Earth. The high number and wide distribution of these passes, uh, patches suggest that the volcanic activity was quite widespread not so long ago, at least geologically speaking. Three of the deposits are thought to be less than 100 million years old, and Ina might even be less than 50 million years old, according to the study. So... The researchers said they used a technique that links the crater measurements to the ages of the moon's dirt samples scooped up during the Apollo missions and the Soviet Union's robotic lunar missions. The findings were detailed online to October 12th in the journal Geoscience. Um, so we're finding out more and more about the moon. A lot of good stuff. I got some good moon videos coming up too. Uh, I haven't. Mars has just been hitting me like bam, bam, bam. There's been so much to do with Mars. I haven't had a chance to make some of the other videos. So. Another one that I thought was cool. This is this I, I saw this on a couple different ones. This was from CNN as as the link below. 
sleeper spaceship could carry first humans on Mars in hibernation state. And if you've watched Mission to Mars, I know, well, not Mission to Mars, what was it? Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was the, it was the movie where uh, where Tom Cruise or whatever he uh, he he basically was piloting the craft and the aliens and the Tet, and uh, they stayed behind as like the mop of crew, but really the aliens cloned a bunch of us. They, the, the technology in the spacecraft, they had this in, and I thought it was really cool thinking then, say, if you could put people to sleep, keep them, you know, somehow their muscles from getting that crazy atrophy. So six astronauts lie motionless in a row of their compartments with medical monitoring cables connected in their bodies as their spaceship cuts through the silent blackness that separates Earth from Mars. They sound asleep and will be for the extent of their six-month trip, having been placed in an artificially induced state of hibernation called torpor. torpor. I think that's how you say that. This is the way a NASA-funded study sees space exploration travel to Mars, unconscious, with the metabolism switched to slow motion. That's probably the best way to go there. Sending astronauts that far into space would be too challenging, costly, and grueling without it, says space engineer John Bradford, whose Atlanta-based company Spaceworks wrote the study for NASA. Ultimately, it's what we'll have to do, he says. Sci-fi becomes reality. All right. I guess they're in... They didn't even mention it when I was. Sleeper spacecraft with crews in suspended animation have been flying through futuristic sci-fi films like Avatar, Alien, Panadorium, and 2001 A Space Odyssey for decades. Now science reality is catching up. Really is catching up. Reality is catching up. As medical advances have made stasis status possible via a method called therapeutic hypothermia. Um, it has been used since the early 2000s to treat patients with traumatic injuries. Formula One racer uh, Michael Schumacher, from example, who suffered a brain injury while snow skiing, was reportedly put into this uh, therapeutic hypothermia. It renders the patient unconscious by lowering the body temperature. In Schumacher's case, it almost prevented the swelling, also prevented the swelling of the brain that did the torpor stasis, um, which greatly slows metabolism, can help injured prevent patients survive longer while medical teams work to rescue them so this is pretty interesting so they actually have used this stuff before that's what i wonder it's like is this technology like they just put rats to sleep this is uh something i guess that this technology has been uh been tested out before and then but doctors usually induce it for only three or four days at a time not 180 days oh there that's the that's the kick they just got to figure it out um it would take for astronauts to get to mars nor the 180 it would take to get back to earth um 180 days, what they think. I'm, I know we can speed that up, guys. Come on. It may take some time to get this and just get it to the state of effectiveness we wanted to go. Um, that involves animal testing. Of course, like I said, they're going to get the rat out. Then some extended testing on humans, perhaps on the ISS. It could take decades. A shortcut. There's a possible workaround, though, that astronauts could start out with. Space work found a Chinese medical study in which trauma patients stayed in torpor for longer periods. They had a sample of about 80 people that went through therapeutic hypothermia for all sorts of traumatic injuries. At those periods, Periods, they did range from 3 up to 14 days. These patients who stayed under for two weeks fared as well as those who were put under for the shorter time. Two weeks is the same time Spaceworks can live with the one that Bradford says his medical partners at the Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins University are more comfortable with. Well, I'm sure 180 days versus uh, two weeks is definitely more comfortable with as well. Here's how it worked during space flight. The two-week torpor periods would be straddled, so there is always one astronaut who is awake for a brief period. The colleague currently awake could check in on the other ones who are still unconscious to make sure their intravenous feeding tubes are clear and urine removal systems and so are working properly. He can also communicate with Earth. He can check emails. <laughs> he can check his emails. Go figure, right? Um, then after two or three days, he wakes up the next astronaut by activating a heating system that brings his or her, his or her body temperature up to normal. Then, when awakened, the astronaut straps the other into the hibernation module, hooks up the medical systems, inserts the body cooling tube through a nostril, heating pads beyond the astronaut to make sure the nasal tube doesn't cool down in their body too much. A temperature drop of only about 5 degrees Fahrenheit is necessary, from 98.6 to about 93 degrees. Trace amounts of sed sedatives in the feeding line would suppress the astronaut's shiver reflex. I mean, they got this down to a science, don't they? The habitat unit housing, the sleepers would rotate to create the centrifuge force simulating, gravi simulating gravity that would help to mitigate the reduction in the bone density and natural cause occurs. I mean, 
only thing I see here is how do you keep the people? Like I, said, I, I know it says the reduction of bone density is zero gravity, but I mean, if you watch uh, the people on ISS, they really got to work out hard. They, they're running on their treadmills, they got stuff. So for what, for three days, you get up, you check your buddies, and you just exercise a lot. So there's a lot more that has to be done here. So either way, I'm gonna. That's the link's gonna be in there. I want you to check that out. That's pretty badass. Let's see here. Another one. ESA. Here we go. The European Space Agency. They're, they're sending a rover up. The ESA selects Canada Atlantic sites for its first ever Mars rover. So I'm not going to really read this one to you. The four locations chosen for an earlier shot, as I say that, I'm going to start reading, are close to the Martian equator, include the. Well, yeah, I'm, there's no way I'm going to even say that. Sometimes I wonder, it's like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to say these, but. The main goal of the ExoMars mission will be to search for signs of past and present life. The same thing we're doing right now, and what we do on our channel. Got a really good one coming up about water on Mars and uh, taking some time on it. So, just a little bit about uh, U.S. and India. We, like I said, my channel is really excited about the ISRO. I wasn't really excited about the fact that they, uh, the second they got up there, they teamed up with NASA for things, because I, I really. Now, I was hoping that we were going to get a uh, an outside view of, of maybe to check up on NASA. And this usually always, ha always was going to happen. And it, you know, it is what it is. But since ISR, well, we're not, since we had the MOM go off, we've got a couple pictures. These four pictures are the only ones still there. Nothing, uh, nothing new except on their Facebook page. Look what we got here. This is pretty cool. It's Phobos coming through. If you, it's over here. If we hit play. It's only a four-second clip, a three-second clip. See it moving there? Here it is, right here. So that's all they've put out. You can see down here. It does look a lot more blue than it did in the pictures that they put out on their uh, page. Because a lot of people, look, I've gotten a lot of people emailing me with this picture right here and all they've done was switch it over to blue and there's they, all sorts of anomalies are in here. Same as this. They uh, People were thinking that we're getting the, the shenanigans going on. They, they're hiding the blue again from us. And I was hoping that wasn't going to happen. Um, but obviously, it's still taking pictures. I know they had to get ready for uh, the comet to come by, but it's still taking pictures. They're just not releasing them, as I hope they would. But the uh, blue around here definitely is interesting. But you see little Phobos. This is this little guy right here moving around. So, all right, guys, that's space news for you. It's been a, minute. It's been a little while since I've talked to you guys. Like I said, it's getting late. It's uh, October. What is today? It's Thursday now. That's going to come out Friday for you. It'll be Friday morning, so it is October 17th. Much love to you. Check out the website. A lot of new good stuff's going on there. Peace.